Bibles tonight, go with me to the 139th Psalm, Psalm 139. I'm going to read verses 13 through 16. I hope tonight you brought your Bible and something to write on or write with. Uh, we're going to be going to a number of scriptures, but I just give you a heads up. So we're going to be in the book of Psalms. Uh, we're going to be in the book of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 15. And then we're going to eventually land in Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. So if you need a little extra time in, in knowing, in, in turning to that, if you'd like to be there already or ahead of time, uh, we'll be in uh, Psalm 139, 1 Corinthians 15, and then Ephesians chapter 1. We'll also be looking at several other scriptures tonight. Now, there's going to be a lot I'm going to give you tonight in this message. A lot of biblical, this is a biblically meaty message. You say, Pastor, I'm not able to write it all down, or I didn't get it all, I missed something. Just let me know. Uh, we can go right down to the office. I can print this off for you, and uh, you can have a printed copy. And uh, So if that would be easier for you, just let me know. If you say, Pastor, if you email that to me, I can email you the notes, and and uh, we'll get that to you. Psalm 139 tonight, notice with me in verse 13 through 16, our text tonight, specifically verse 14, as David is a, this inspired psalm, David is rejoicing in God's creation of him and his inner working and knowing of him. Notice in Psalm 139 in verse 13, for thou, he's talking to God, has possessed my reins. That's his heart, his mind, his will is his emotions. For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. David is rejoicing at the marvelous work of not only his conception, but his uh, construction, how God has made him the wonderful, the, the wonderful miracle of the birth of life and the gift of life and the, the wonderful creation that God has made. The Bible says this in verse 14. Yea, well, praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret, and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Verse 16, thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect, and in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. Notice this in verse 14. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. Possessing a biblically based Christian or identity in Christ. Let's pray tonight. Father, we thank you. God, we need your help tonight. And God, as I bring this message, God, I believe it's a message for our times. Lord, you please, I, I need you to fill me with the Spirit of God for wisdom and for utterance tonight. And Lord, bring these many truths together in a cohesive and understandable sermon and so, God, I'm asking you to please work and speak through me. And, Lord, I'm asking you to please work uh, in, in the enabling and the hearing and the understanding of all those that are present tonight. And, Lord, those that are watching online and the many, Lord, that will watch in the future to come. And so, Father, we pray, help us, Lord. We live in a time of great confusion and something that should be, and, Lord, you intended to be so very clear, our identity. So, Lord, we ask you for your help tonight in Jesus' name, and amen. May I just say that we're in, and I, I want to continually bring us back to this, we're in a series called The Overcomers. We live in a day and a time where so many are being overcome by so many different of life's challenges and pressures. In 1 John chapter 4, and verse 4, the Bible says, Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them. Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. I just want to remind you as God's children, you and I, we are on the winning side. Now, we'll just jump into the message tonight. I put something here in, in Psalm 139. We may or may not come back here. But I want you to go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 tonight, we're going to just launch into the message and the truth that God would like to lay before us tonight, but I want you to see a statement of identity. Let me make a statement tonight. Your identity 
comes from God and your identity matters. Let me say that again. Your identity comes from God and your identity matters. In 1 Corinthians and chapter 15 and verse 10, the Bible says, the Apostle Paul giving testimony, he says, but by the grace of God, you see that? By the grace of God, notice this next phrase, I am what I am. That is a declaration, a statement of identity. The Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of God, is saying, listen, your identity, who and what you are, is from God Almighty. Your identity comes from God, and your identity matters. Now, we live in a day, we live in a society, we live in a world that is removing the sure foundations of God's God-given identity. Now, it would be very easy for those of us of a certain generation and older to sneer, to snicker, or to look down upon those who are genuinely struggling with their identity. Can I say that is not helpful? That is not, listen, that's not godly, that's not good, that's not helpful. Friend, listen, just because you or I do not struggle in an area, can I just say that does not mean that you and I are not struggling. And I say every single one of us struggle with something. And I believe there are generational sins, sins that affect specific generations. And I believe in our time, in our, in our day, the generation that is coming up now, that is in their uh, uh, seven, uh, those that, uh, pre-10, from 10 to 20s and 20s to 30s, can I say they are struggling with this matter of their identity. Society, listen, society, having been corrupted by Satan, has removed the reference points, the foundations. And listen, they are being challenged to, be, be, uh, to solidify their identity based on the, listen, their identity of their gender, their race, their creed, their species. Listen, on the ever-fluing changes of their mind and emotion and their culture. Listen, there is a reason, let's step back, there is a reason why even society says you have to be 16 before you can get your operating license for a car. We understand that there is a maturing process that happens from birth to 16. There is a reason why society says that until you're the age of 18 that you should not be making decisions like who's going to be the president of the United States. There's a reason why, and of course we certainly do, wouldn't agree with this, it doesn't matter what age you are, but certainly society says, listen, under, under the age of 21 there are certain products that you should not buy or participate in because you don't understand the consequences of that. Then friend, why is it that if society says you, can't, you have to be a certain age to uh, drive a car, or to participate in a, an election, or to purchase certain things, listen, why is it that parents are taking their children at 5 and 7 and 10 and 12 and 17 to have their identity completely altered. Medically, physically, interacting and, and, and interposing because they are choosing. Listen, and the, uh, can I say, listen, we need to understand. Listen, though we, we may not understand, we don't grasp it. It is alien to us. Can I say, we should never, never, listen. They need someone to love them. They need someone to care about them. They need someone to, to say, listen, you are a, a gift from God and, and you have an identity that is not based on your ever fluctuating feelings or the ever changing ebbs of flow of culture and society. That Listen, there are things that you can stand and build a life and identity on. You can know who and what you are. Where God brought clarity and certainty. Listen, this world under Satan has brought confusion. What God meant to be clear and meant to be certain, this world has removed from the, uh, this generation and made it very, very confused. And we wonder why they're confused and hurting and isolating and, and they're desperate. Can I say this? It is because they lack their God-given identity given to them by God. And we, listen, it is we, it is we who must help. We who must bring, listen, we, we must, uh, listen, it is God's people. It is God's church. Listen, parents, if you have children, you need to be giving them, listen, the pastor's a good thing, but listen, the pastor is no replacement for a parent. Can I say a youth pastor and his wife is no replacement for a mom and dad who are teaching and leading and showing and helping and answering their children's uh, and their young people and their adults and their young adults' questions. From the word of God, 
Listen, a, a, a pastor and a youth pastor, a church is no replacement for a home where the word of God is open and explained and the truths of God are presented. Now, can I say this? The foundation of gender, ethnic, national, relational identity, even species, has been taken out from this generation. And we need to understand the importance of it. Now, I want you to take and go with me to Jonah, the book of Jonah in the Old Testament. In the book of Jonah, got Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentation, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah. You say, Pastor, why are you doing that? Because that's the only way I can find it. Start on a book that I know, and then just keep it working my way till I remember where it is, and I go, oh, there it is. Jonah chapter 1. Now, I want you to see here that, that identity is knowable. Truth number one tonight, identity is knowable. We have this intriguing insight into this ancient conversation here, halfway around the world in the Mediterranean Sea, uh, that Jonah is on a boat and things have gone bad and people are trying to figure out who he is, where he's from, and what's going on. And so they ask him these identity questions. Notice me, Jonah, and chapter 1 and verse 8, you know the story and the back story. Then said they, these are the mariners on the boat trying to figure out what's going on. Then said they unto him, tell us, we pray thee. Look at these questions there. Number one, for whose cause this evil is upon us? Number two, what is thy occupation? Number three, and whence comest thou? And number four, and what is thy country? And number five, of what people art thou? These are questions about identity. Can I say everything that we know and all that we interact is based on our identity. That's how we figure out the world. That's how we understand other people. That's how we relate to other people. That's how we learn. It all is based on this God-given identity of who we are, where we're from, and what we do. So let's break this down. Number one, they were asking his identity of action. What did you do? All right, listen, can I just say tonight, who you are in large part is a result of the choices you've made and the actions that you've done. Number two, number two, they were asking him his job. Not only what did you do, but what do you do? What is your occupation? What do you do for a living? We d tend to size people up by that and have an idea of their identity. Number three, they asked his location of origination. Whence comest thou? Hey, wh where did you get on this boat? Listen, when you talk to people, oh, where are you from? Oh, I'm from Holland. Where are you from? Oh, I'm from Battle Creek. Where are you from? Oh, I'm from Ann Arbor. Where are you from? Oh, I'm from San Francisco. Where are you from? Oh, I'm from New York. Listen, we tend to size people up from where they're coming from. Oh, it helps me to understand your background. and It helps me to understand your point of view. It helps me to understand your perspective. It helps me to maybe understand your politics. All right? So they're asking, hey, where did you get on this boat? All right, oh, you got it in Joppa. You're one of those guys. All right? Number four, they asked him of his nationality his country now we in america are a melting pot most of us cannot say we are americans not native americans if you ask me what's uh, what's your nationality well i'm an american i have an american passport i'm an american citizen that was his nationality listen we think that we're the first cosmopolitan society listen friend there were people going from all over the world all over the place and even though and by the way this is different from his his ethnicity notice with that last thing and of what people art thou all right that was his ethnicity what is your ethnic heritage these my friends were identifying questions they were trying to narrow down and they were trying to define and understand who this guy is what he's all about and where he's going and what he's doing these were questions of identity so may i just say this number one identity is Knowable. Say that with me. Identity is knowable. Identity is not fluid. Identity is fixed. There are certain things in this life. Young people, listen to me tonight. There are certain things given by God that are fixed and firm. Now, some things in your identity are fluid. Your job, your education, uh, different things that you choose. What the, the choices you make in your life will impact your identity. But I want to just make that point. That identity is knowable. Now, 
Let me give you, this is part number two. So that's part number one, identity is noble. Part number two in this message is this. We're going to look at four basic human identities. Four basis or four foundations of human identity. Number one, I want you to go back with me to the book of Genesis. The book of Genesis. I said this is going to be a Bible-rich message. We're going to look all over the Bible. There's several different sections in this message. But number two, number one, identity is knowable. You can know who you are and what you are. Number two, there are four foundational identity markers for every human being. Four foundational identity markers for every human being. Number one, look with me in Genesis and chapter one. Look with me in verse 26. And God said, who is speaking here? God is speaking here. And God said, let us. Who's he talking to? The Father is talking to the Son, talking to the Spirit. It is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. This is the triune God. And God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. That's why you can squish bugs. God gave you to be in charge of them. All right. Now, number one, foundational identity marker number one, every person is a special creation from God. Every person is a special creation from God. Listen, God put the breath of life into Adam. God then created Eve from Adam. And Adam and Eve started the natural process of childbearing. And that spark of life has carried down through every generation. And every child carries with them that spark of life. Listen, from God's original creation, every man, every woman, every boy, every girl, every teenager is a special creation from God. Listen, no child is a mistake. You may have not planned that child, but God planned that child. Listen, friend, can I just say to you today, where did you come from? What's the meaning of life? Why am I here? Because God willed that you would be here. You are a special creation from God. Number two, second foundational identity marker. Look at verse, look at verse 27. In verse 27, the Bible says this, so God created man in his own image in the image of God created he, him, notice this, male and female created he, them. Marker number two is this, not only is every person a special creation from God, every person is a specific gender from God. Now I know that's revolutionary, it's mind-blowing to our society today, but can I say based on the truth and the authority of God's word, and listen, one day this is going to be hate speech, one of these days it's going to be banned from Facebook and YouTube, one of these days, listen, they're going to give us all kinds of fits, but listen friend, try as they might, Psalm chapter 2, why did the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing, I'll tell you this, because every person is a specific gender from God. Listen, friend, your gender is not fluid. Your gender was assigned to you, not by the doctor, not by you, but by your creator, God himself. Listen, and down to the very microscopic cellular level at the very essence of your DNA, there is a difference between male and female. And no matter how much hormones you pump in, now no matter how much surgery that is performed, listen, down to the very mitochondrial uh, essence of your DNA, friend, that you are either a a male or a female because every person is a specific gender from God. That's identity marker number two. Friend, please, this is truth you need to get to your children and to your grandchildren and to their friends because this is not being told. This is being denied them. These foundational truths are being taken away from them. Now, number three, number three, go with me to the book of Isaiah, back into the prophetical books. You have Isaiah, you have the Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, and then Isaiah. Isaiah is a pretty big book. It's kind of hard to miss when you're flipping through your Bible. Go with me to Isaiah chapter 59. Isaiah chapter 59. Now, these apply to all human beings. Every single human being, saved or unsaved, falls into these categories. Number one, they're a special creation from God. Number two, they're a specific gender from God. Number three, notice with me in Isaiah chapter 59 and verse 2, the Bible says this, but your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. Number three, every human being born on this planet is a born a sinner separated from God. 
I want you to notice the wording here. Number one, every person is a special creation of God. Number two, every person is a specific gender from God. Number three, every person is born a sinner separated from God. The Bible says this, in fact, if you're taking notes, Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Every person is born a sinner and then commits sin. Now, that's the bad news. Everyone is born a sinner. Now, please understand this, and, and I'm not endorsing the statement, but please understand every lie is a half-truth. Every lie is a half-truth. Everything the devil said was a half-truth. And there are people that say, well, I, I'm inclined this way, or I feel this way, or I'm born this way. Listen, they're half right. They were born a sinner. They were born with a sin nature that leads them contrary to God's will and God's ways. It gave them depraved thoughts and tendencies. Listen, God did not assign them to be a sinner. God did not assign them with specific feelings or inclinations. But they were born a sinner, and thus a sinner will do and be and choose sinful things. So please understand that. Now, that's number three. Now with number four. Number four, go with me to the New Testament book of Galatians, Galatians, and then Ephesians. And this is where we're going to park for the rest of the night. We're going to look at Galatians, one verse in Galatians, Galatians chapter 3. Notice with me in verse 26. This is where it all changes. This is right here is where eternity and your identity hinges. Notice with me in Galatians chapter 3, look at verse 26. For ye are all the children of God, how? By faith in Christ Jesus. Now listen, every person is a special creation from God. Every person is assigned a specific gender from God. Every person is born a sinner separated from God. But every man and woman, boy and girl, listen, who get the gospel have the opportunity to become a child of God. How? By faith in Christ Jesus. Jesus. Heard a statement this week and it shook me. Heard a statement this week and it just punched me. Somebody said this, do you know the gospel is only good news if it gets to people in time? How horrible will it be? Think about this, friend. Think about this. How horrible would it be to be born, to grow up, to live and die, and then at the judgment seat of Christ, listen, at the great white throne judgment, realize that there was a way, a truth, and a life. There was a way your sins could be forgiven. There's a way that you could have your uh, name written in the book of life. There's a way that you could escape hell and gain heaven. And nobody ever told you. The gospel is only good news if it gets there in time. That's why Rose Park Baptist Church, listen, that's why we are purposed for world and local evangelism. As long as I'm your pastor... I'm going to beat the drum loud and large and long till the day I drop over dead, friend. Listen, the fact that we have a lost and dying world who desperately needs to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. Because listen, friend, how frustrating, how horrible, how awful it would be to get onto the other side when it's, listen, when it's too late. And no one ever told them about Jesus. Listen, friend, I'm purposed. So as much as in me is, listen, friend, there's not going to be one house, one person, one soul in this entire western Michigan. Listen, I'm going to do everything that God will allow me to do to reach every home, every soul, every person with the gospel. Friend, listen, we are just getting started. Listen, friend, the, the, the best days, the, 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 the big push of Rose Park Baptist Church, by God's grace, has not yet happened. Listen, friend, we're going to send out mailers. We're going to take out gospel tracts. We're going to go door to door. We're going to soul win. We're going to reach. Listen, friend, I want to get on the radio. I want to get on TV. I want to get on buses. I want to get on billboards. Listen, friend, I want to put a, a, a gospel mailer in every single. I was on the phone with the, uh, the postcard mailers, and I said, what would it cost me to give a postcard with the gospel to every person in my county? And the lady said, no one's ever asked me that. I said, well, let me be the first. Let me be the first. She says, I'll have to look into that and get back with you. Amen? You pray about that. Best I can tell. Best I can tell right now, it's going to cost us 50 cents a house. 50 cents a house to get a nice, full-color, glossy postcard with the gospel and an invitation to church on it. I really want you to pray in the coming days what God would have us to do. How many houses could we reach with the gospel? Now listen, four foundational truths, and then we'll get into the last part of the message. Foundational marker, as a, every person has the opportunity to become a child of God by faith in Christ Jesus. 
These are the foundational truths. Now, I want you to go over to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. This is where it hinges. This is where it changes. As a Christian, as a child of God. Now listen, I identify, I identify as a special creation from God. Number two, I identify as a specific gender from God. Number three, I identify as a sinner born separated from God. But by the grace of God and the faith in Jesus Christ, I identify as a saint who's been forgiven of my sin. That's who I identify. That's my identity that comes from God. Friend, you need to own it. You need to realize it. You need to internalize it. You need to stand on it. But listen, as a believer in Jesus Christ, I just want to point out to you these wonderful truths from Ephesians chapter 1. As a believer, your identity in Christ. Who are you in Jesus Christ? Notice with me in in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3. And with these, I'll go very quickly. Number one, the Bible says this in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3. By the way, this is my identity as a believer in Jesus Christ. This is the third part of the message. First part of the message is identity is knowable. Number two is four foundational markers of the every person that's born on this planet. Number, section number three is my identity because I am a believer in Jesus Christ. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3 says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. How? In Christ. Because I am in Jesus, because I am saved, number one, I identify as being very blessed. How many of you guys are glad you're on your way to heaven? Say amen. How many are glad your sins are forgiven? Will you say amen? How many are glad your name's written in the Lamb's book of life? Say amen. How many are glad you have a new father, a new nature? Listen, a new destiny. Can I just say, we are very blessed. You say, who are you? I'm blessed, friend. On my worst day, I'm blessed. I identify as being blessed. Look at verse 4. According as he hath chosen us in him. Before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Number two, I identify as chosen. Thank God. God looked down into this old wicked world and saw men and women, boys and girls, teenagers, who he decided to save. Now, not by, we're not talking about the doctrine of uh, election or predestination. We're saying this, that the Lord Jesus, that the Lord God Almighty chose the purpose and plan and path and way of salvation through his son. But listen, friend, he decided to choose us for the wonderful gift of salvation. God says, I choose to make a way for them to be saved. I thank God that he chose me. He gave me the opportunity to identify as being chosen, as being wanted. Look at verse 5. Number one, in Christ I'm blessed. Number two, in Christ I'm chosen. Look at verse 5. Having predestinated us. That means that, that when God de- set down the plan of salvation, he says, where's this thing taking us? Where's it going to end up? That's what that word means. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Christ Jesus to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. Praise God. Number three, I identify as being adopted. Listen, I was once a child of the devil, but God gave me a new father, a new family, and a new home. Because of Jesus, I identify as being adopted into the family of God. Why? Because it was good according to the good pleasure of his will. Notice with me in verse 6. To the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the Beloved. See, friend, this world, they're crying for acceptance outside of Christ, not realizing that it is in Christ that they seek all that they seek. Friend, they're looking for acceptance and identity and validation. Friend, that does not come outside of Christ. It comes in and with Christ because of Jesus. Listen, I am no longer an outcast. I'm no longer an alien. I'm no longer far away from God. I have been accepted. Listen, not because of me. Listen, uh, not because of my sins, but in spite of my sins. But because of what Jesus did for me and his atoning work and his forgiveness. Can I say this? That he has accepted me. He has made me to be acceptable to him. I thank God for a God who cleansed me and drew me close to him. Look at verse 7. I identify as accepted. In whom we have redemption 
through his blood the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Friend, if you know your heart and I know my heart, listen, friend, the older I get and the longer I live, the more amazing salvation is. I'm not getting over my salvation. I'm getting amazed that God would save me. I identify here in this verse as redeemed and forgiven. Who is your identity? Who is my identity? Who am I? How do you identify? I identify as redeemed. I was lost. I was on my way to hell. And Jesus loved me enough to buy me. He redeemed me. And he forgave me. I identify, listen, as forgiven. Not perfect, but forgiven. Listen, perfect in Christ. Look at verse 11 and we're all done. The seventh thing. In verse 11, the Bible says this. In whom, talking about Jesus, we have obtained an inheritance. Being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Seventh thing is I identify as a part of the family of faith. God has given us an inheritance in Christ. He has given us a part of his kingdom and his eternal work. God has given us an inheritance. He has made us as a part of the family. Friend, tonight, I want you to take these truths. Listen, this is not something to go, nah, 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 look at me. All right, no, 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 no. No, it is not of works that any should boast. Listen, it's grace that, it, that, that none of us should boast. Can I say this? You and I, listen, we need to own our identity, a biblical identity in Christ. Number two, we need to take these truths to those who are struggling. And we need to open, listen, the prison doors of the darkness that the devil has put them in. And we need to share with them the glorious truth. Listen, they can know their identity. Number two, they can have a relationship with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. And they can identify as the most blessed, wonderful people on the face of the planet. Our identity in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for these truths. Lord, I thank you that from time immemorial, Lord, from eternity past, God, you knew we would come to 2023. God, you knew that people would struggle with their identity. And God, you purposed and planned in the fullness and the sufficiency of the scriptures to give us the answers we need. Thank you for the Bible. Lord, I pray. I pray if there's one here tonight, dear Lord, that's struggling with their identity. Lord, I pray that they would find hope and assurance through your truth. Lord, I pray if there's someone here tonight that's struggling with their salvation, or Lord, the truth of their salvation, or Lord, the fact if they are saved as a child of God, Lord, I pray that, Lord, they would find their identity in Christ. Lord, that they would open their hearts, they would repent of their sins, they would call upon the name of the Lord, and Lord, they would put their faith and trust in you to save them. And Lord, that is a life and an eternity tra changing transaction. Father, I pray that we would dwell on these truths. Lord, we would stand upon them, we would believe them from your word. And I pray, dear Lord, that we would walk and live in the certainty of our identity. Thank you, Lord, for your many blessings. I ask this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll stand this evening with our heads bowed and eyes closed as the instruments begin to play a verse of invitation softly tonight.